Good morning, it's Ranger Russ again. And if you are, if it looks like I'm in the woods, then you're right. I'm in the woods room here at the Meggs Point Nature Center. Uh, I really want to do a shout out to everybody that responded and uh, watched our video yesterday. It was a lot of fun doing it and we're going to have more fun today. So, first of all, we need to do a little bit of a thank you because the DEP, the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, that's who run this facility, that's who this facility belongs to, and we're really happy and excited that, that they're promoting this event. So, um, big shout out to the DEP. Today, our animal is really, really special, but before we get to it, I want to make answer a couple of the questions that were put up yesterday. A lot of people had questions about whether the turtles would make good pets, whether they should be pets, things like that. I'm going to say right off the bat in general, it's best not to have a wild animal as a pet. You shouldn't be taking them out of the wild. Uh, they, they do much, much better in the wild than they do as pets. All of our turtles have either been injured or they were taken from the wild as hatchlings and wouldn't be able to survive in the wild. And most of our snakes, it's the same. So most of our reptiles never been in the wild and should not be in the wild. Okay. People are saying you're sideways. All right. We're just going to flip the, the camera. Okay. Is that better? I'm told that, that you're all seeing me sideways, which is not a good thing. That's better. All right. So, again. These animals, they belong in the wild. They should remain in the wild all the time. Okay, now, another question that we had yesterday about our stink pot was that, does it have special feet for climbing trees? It actually doesn't really have special feet. Its feet look like all the other ones, but it's just a better climber and it really wants to climb. I think other turtles would be able to climb if they wanted to or really needed to but uh, it just really wants to climb where the other turtles don't. So we're talking about another reptile today. And yesterday we mentioned that reptiles were ectothermic, if everybody remembers that. And ectothermic means that they don't produce their own heat. They rely on heat from external sources. In most cases, they're out in the environment. Here in the nature center, we have heat for them. Today's reptile is quite a bit different, okay? This one is a snake, and you probably can't see it, but it's climbing out of the tank on its own, so I'm just gonna pick it up. Now, another thing that all reptiles have in common is that they have scales. So if you look closely, this is our northern black racer. You can see the scales on this absolutely beautiful snake. This little guy right here um, lives all over Connecticut. Now, another question that we had a lot yesterday was where these animals are found. So these animals, everything that we have in the nature center can be found in the nature center. Some of them may be invasive species, which means they're not native to the area, but they're now found in the area. Um, but this one is native to Connecticut and found throughout the state. Now, they prefer wooded areas, slightly wooded areas, not, not thickly wooded areas. Field edges are a great place for them. The racers really like to eat amphibians. So frogs and salamanders are on the menu. And if you look behind me, there are some amphibian uh, aquariums with some frogs in them. So we're going to keep the snake away from those frogs although he can probably smell the amphibians from here. Snakes use their tongues to smell. So if you all want to point to what you use to smell, nobody should be pointing to their tongues, right? 
The snakes use their tongues in the same way that we use our noses. When you breathe in, you're breathing in little particles. There are scent particles in the air and you breathe those in and that's what tells you what you're smelling. The snake waves its tongue and those particles collect on the tongue. Then as they bring them in, it touches something called a Jacobson's organ, which for you, it's inside your nose and that's what's interpret, what interprets smell. For the snake, it is on the roof of their mouth. So as the tongue goes in, it brushes against the roof of the mouth. It picks up those scent particles and it tells the snake what it is that's around them, what it can smell. Now, snakes are really special. You can see he's sticking his tongue out there. Once in a while he'll do it, probably won't now because I asked him to. Um, but you can see they have a forked tongue. This allows the snake to track down its food using a sense of smell. Now we can breathe in and we can tell, okay, somebody's cooking cookies somewhere, but we won't be able to tell where those cookies are coming from, right? Once you breathe in, your two sinuses here, they come together into one cavity. So you're not gonna be able to separate the difference between where the smell is coming from. The snake has two different tips to its tongue. Each one touches a different part of the Jacobson's organ and now it can tell. So if this snake is smelling the frog that's right over here, it's gonna have a stronger scent on this side of its tongue and it's gonna know, oh, that's the way we need to go to find the frog, okay? So they do prefer to eat amphibians. They will eat uh, birds and rodents and other things if they encounter them. But rodents are their, are their primary food, are, uh, amphibians are their primary food source. Now, this snake, all right, it's completely black. It has very big eyes. So it is fine hunting at night. And snakes do have a sense of vision, even though they're re relying on their tongue to find their food, they still can see pretty well. The snake though, it's not only gonna be active at night, it depends on the temperature. So in the spring and the fall, when the days are just warm enough for them to be out, but the nights are too cold, they're gonna be active during the day. In the heat of the summer, when it gets too hot during the day, they're gonna be active more in the evenings and at night. So they know the best times, the, the ideal temperature for them to be moving around and that's where they're gonna, that's what they're gonna do. Now, something really special about snakes. About half of the snakes that we have in Connecticut lay eggs, and the, which most reptiles do, and the other half actually keep the eggs inside of them. This is one of our egg-laying snakes, and that means that this snake is oviparous. It has eggs and it lays those eggs in clutches of between three and 32 eggs at a time. They're usually gonna lay them under a moist log or something like that. These snakes only live about 10 years in the wild and they'll get up to five feet long. So it's a good sized snake, but they don't really live as long as they would in captivity. Uh, in captivity, they're expected to live a little bit longer. That doesn't mean that they make a good pet. Uh, but they do, with proper care, they can live um, almost 20 years in captivity. That would be pushing it. I'd say 15 to 20 years. Okay, so they eat amphibians. They're active, you know, depending on the time of the day, but they can be active at night. Now, when you look at a snake, a lot of people wonder, okay, how long is the snake's tail? They think, oh, this very big snake, this one here, Let's back up so you can see how long this guy is. Now it's hard to tell male from female. I keep saying him. Uh, the way that you tell is through an internal probe uh, through their cloaca where they go to the bathroom. So we don't do it with all of our snakes, but again, most of our snakes in the nature center are injured. This one is injured and when they go to the vet, they do get uh, checked out. And this one was checked out and it is a boy, but it's a pretty long snake but the tail is only from there on, okay? And you can see that's its injury, actually, the cloaca. It has uh, growth going there, which has to be continually removed and cleaned and taken care of. But this is all 
of the snake's tail. And this is a long tail for a snake in Connecticut. Most of the snakes in Connecticut have relatively short tails for the length of its body. Okay. All right. So I'm seeing lots of comments come up here. Um, somebody's asking, can snakes eat things that are bigger than they are? Great question. And I'm going to guess that you already know the answer. Snakes can eat things that are three times the size of their heads. So if you look how big that head is around, a snake can swallow something that is three times the size of that head. So for this snake right here, it would be able to eat a frog probably about that big, all right? Quite a bit bigger than its head, much more than we would be able to eat. And the way that they're able to do that, if everybody out there opens your mouth as wide as you can, see how much we can open our mouths? It's usually about, about 90 degrees, okay? That's what we can open our mouths. The snakes, they have an articulated jaw. So if you feel your jaw as it opens and closes, their jaw, it's like being double jointed. So they can open their jaw straight up and down. Also, if you feel your lower jaw, they have, you have one solid piece across, they have two separate jaws. So it goes down and then apart, and then it's able to open its mouth nice and big and swallow its prey, okay? If you were able to eat something three times the size of your head, you would be able to swallow a large watermelon in one bite. Okay, so that is very impressive. Now someone is asking if the snake is venomous. This is a non-venomous snake. Uh, we do have a venomous snake at the Nature Center, which I will be talking about in a later episode, but this is what we call a live feeder because typically, Typically, when they're eating frogs and salamanders, they just grab them and swallow them whole and alive. Okay, kind of gross, but that's the way this snake gets its food. All right, let's see if we've got some other ones. Can this snake eat another snake? Skylar wants to know that. And there are snakes that do eat other snakes. This is not one that will typically eat other snakes, but there are some out there. Okay, let's see what else we have. Do you have any good questions there, Sydney? Um, yeah, so... Uh, Sydney is... Are there scales on the bottom of the snake as well? Are there scales? Yes. Are there scales on the bottom of the snake? So you can see these scales are sort of triangular shaped. If you look at the belly, the scales are more rectangular shaped. So there, there are scales, but there are different shapes to these uh, scales on the belly. Now, we're not sure about this one. Again, this is an injured snake. It came into us as an adult, so it's very hard to tell. Snakes grow depending on how much food they get. So if they're in a place with lots of food, they're going to get larger. If they don't have as much food, they're not going to grow as fast. Now, I just saw a really good question. Somebody wants to know how fast the snake goes. It is called a black racer. So you would think, wow, that's a really fast snake. It is a fast snake in the snake world. It can go about eight to 10 miles an hour, which for most adults, that's a, a pretty good jog. That's a jogging pace for most humans. For other snakes, this is a very fast snake. All right, do we have another one? Yeah, Henry asked, uh, how big is a snake's brain? Henry wants to know how big a snake's brain is. All right, so we can see the size of its head. And from that, you can see it's got pretty big eyes. It's got a big mouth. So its brain, not so big. Uh, they are pretty intelligent. They have a lot of instincts, though, that allow them to survive. Uh, a lot of people are asking, maybe just repeat, where, how can you tell where, where the tail starts? How do you tell where the tail starts? That's a very good question. And it starts at the cloaca where they go to the bathroom from, that opening, and then they go on from there. So that's the beginning of the tail. All right, I'm gonna put this guy down and I just wanna talk about a couple of things. 
So this afternoon, we're going to be moving into our water room. And this is a great opportunity for you to participate. We're going to, I'm going to give you a few animals that we can talk about. And you get to choose which animal we're going to do. So we're going to be doing a fish this afternoon. It could be a striped bass. It could be an oyster toadfish. Or it could be a catfish, a bullhead catfish. So I want you to keep on commenting. Let us know which one you prefer. And then we're going to talk about whichever one gets the most votes at the end of the day. Um, this has been a really fun thing for me to do. I really appreciate all the comments and questions and keep them coming. If you want more information about the Nature Center, I really encourage you to go to our website, megspointnaturecenter.org. Even if you don't live in Connecticut, there's plenty of resources on there that are not just about the Connecticut environment. It's about uh, the environment in general, a lot of information. We're going to be adding more information as we go. I also would like you to post some pictures of things that you're finding in your environment, okay? Don't just sit inside. I know we have to keep social distance, but you can go outside and get some fresh air, get some sunlight, take some pictures, put them up, and let me know what the coolest thing that you're finding in your environment, your backyard, the park. Um, it's still a great time to, to go hiking. So I also encourage everyone to like us on Facebook. It's really important to, to build up the momentum, get all of your friends following us, and we can do more of this. The more we go, the more uh, we can do. And then lastly, before I let everybody go, I really want to give a shout out and a thank you to the Friends of Hammonasset. The Friends of Hammonasset are an organization that supports the park. Across Connecticut, there are some really awesome groups of people that help their local parks. And here we have the Friends of Hammonasset. They have donated hundreds of thousands of dollars. And the exhibit, this tree you see behind me, the reason I feel like I'm in a forest, even though I'm in the nature center, it's because of their money that they donated. They sponsored all of the exhibits here, the aquariums that hold the animals, the fish tanks, those all come from the Friends of Ham and Acid. So I wanna give a big shout out to the Friends. And you know, if you're not a member, join the Friends of Ham and Acid. If you live in the state of Connecticut, I'm sure you visited Ham and Acid and appreciate the park. So again, thank you all for tuning in. We'll be back at two o'clock for another live animal presentation.